Summer PhD candidate here at McMaster University. Um, I'm here to moderate and introduce our illustrious, uh, our panel of illustrious uh, authors today. I'm going to do a brief introduction of each author and then I'm going to pass it over to them. They're going to read for about 10 minutes each and then we will open the floor to uh, Q&A. Um, so, uh, joining us from Skype is Aisha Marjara. She uh, is currently located in Montreal, Quebec, uh, based there, where she has written and directed several critically acclaimed award-winning films, including, but not only, the experimental short, The Incredible Shrinking Woman, The Tourist, a short drama about a Canadian tourist, and of course, her well-known 1999 uh, NFB docudrama, Desperately Seeking Helen which delves into her adolescent experiences of having lost her mother and sister on the Air India crash while being treated for anorexia nervosa, a topic that she revisits in her debut young adult novel today, uh, Fairy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, Aisha. Hello. Uh, our next author today joins us from Toronto, uh, Farzana Doctor, sitting in the middle over there. Uh, she will be reading from her 2015 novel, All Inclusive, um, which takes place on an all-exclusive resort and remembers the Air India tragedy through the protagonist's search for her unknown disappeared father. Farzana's first novel, Stealing Nazreen, was published in 2007 and has been widely studied across university classrooms. And her second novel, Six Meters of Pavement, was published in 2012, has received much critical acclaim as it has won the Lambda Award for Lesbian General Fiction and was a finalist for the 2012 Toronto Book Award. Our third author today joining us is Renee Saragini Saklikar. Um, she joins us from the West Coast, uh, actually East Vancouver in BC, and she's currently Surrey's inaugural poet laureate. Renee writes the Canada Project, a lifelong poem chronicle about place, identity, and language, pieces of which have been published in journals, anthologies, and newspapers. Today, she will be reading from her first completed book from the Canada Project, Children of Air India, Unauthorized Exhibits and Interjections, which was published in 2013 and won the 2014 Canadian Authors Literary Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the 2014 Dorothy Livesay Poetry Award. Children of Air India contains a series of elegiac sequences that explore the nature of individual loss situated within public trauma. Our last author joins us from um, Padma uh, Viswanathan, joins us from U the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, where she teaches fiction writing and literature. Her debut no novel, The Toss of a Lemon, was published in eight countries, sold out in three, and was a finalist for the Commonwealth Regional First Book Prize, the Amazon.ca First Novel Prize, and the Penn Center USA Fiction Prize. Today, she will be reading from her second novel, The Ever After of Ashwin Rao, which was shortlisted for the Scotia Giller Prize and like her first novel, has succeeded internationally. Her sophomore text features an Indian psychologist trained in Canada who returns to interview people who lost loved ones on the Air India attack, which gets complicated since, since he, was, he also lost family members on that plane. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming all of our authors today uh, who will be reading um, uh, for about 10 minutes in the order that I just introduced. The first author being Aisha Marjara, who'll be reading from her debut novel, Fairy. divided into three parts. The first and the third are is the story of the present day story of Lila in the hospital um, struggling with anorexia. And the, the second part, which I'll read from, is um, a flashback of her childhood when she's 14. So the first chapter is called 18. Uh, I had a plan, a wish for my 18th birthday. 
I dreamed of leaving the four walls of the hospital behind and living on the generous offerings of winter, of feeding on snowflakes, melting away the last remaining pounds and withering into oblivion. The numbers one and eight were terrifying to me. I could not face them. I couldn't fathom the hoods of my future, womanhood, adulthood, and most dreadful, however likely, motherhood. No matter how I could or should, could or would shrink my flesh, I was helpless to nature's most incredible and cruel weapon, time. Mid-morning in the middle of February, I paced the hallway as I had many times before and counted each calorie I burned. On the hundredth, I stationed my 68 pound, five foot three frame in front of the hospital elevator while all official eyes were elsewhere. When the doors opened, I made my escape. I darted out the main door, tore across the parking lot, and headed straight for late morning traffic. I began to sing Whitney Houston's I'm Every Woman across down traffic jam Parry Avenue past wide eyes and frozen bodies that watched the spectacle of the emaciated, half-naked humanoid in hospital garb, trying to make a dim-witted escape from time. I built the song from the hollow pit of my stomach, but my vocal cords could only produce ghost words, breathless puffs that dissipated into the frigid air. I dashed down the sloping road and into the hazy cloud of exhaust fumes that rose into the heavens and into my lungs. Shuffling through the snow, I went deeper into downtown where I saw zombie expressions of faces of commuters and shoppers who for a moment stood still as I passed them, attempting to weave a story from this incongruent scene. I could feel my heart part pound hard against my thorax and my lungs collapsed with each exhalation, ribs pressing into skin, throat choking for air. Can I help you, miss? I saw a hand extended, an offer of help that drifted into my indifferent ear, possibly from the man waiting for the ever late number 199 bus. The pale warmth in my flesh drained quickly into a bloodless blue-gray, my limbs slowed and loosened. I was ready to collapse. Oh, finally, I thought, finally, this is the absolute end, the end of me, the end of time, as I knew it. Then, when the shock of winter penetrated my bones, my mother's face appeared to me. I froze in the memory of her embrace. I was cured of the fatal rules of time and of weight. And then, I was back in time again. I felt my arm ripped, nearly ripped from its socket. Stop me, stupid girl. Get back here. The white coats and residents had caught up. They flung my weary body into an ambulance and dragged it into the loneliest room in the hospital. <coughs> I kicked and screamed all the way back, losing fairy tale slipper along the way, and feeling completely the clutch, crushing pain of my hideous life and my fear of growing up. One lethal tranquilizer in the ass, and I was out like Sleeping Beauty. So that's that's like how uh, the the book starts, the story starts of Lila in the hospital making an escape from from the hospital, where she's been already admitted for for a few months. Um, the second. Uh, chapter is um, of Lila when she's 14 years old and in high school, and um, I, I'm gonna. It's called "Hit of Numbers and Nature," um, and Nina is is her younger sister. Uh, Hit of Numbers and Nature. Am I loud enough? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, Hit of numbers in nature. At age 13, Nina was a faithful subscriber to Seventeen and followed its, its ex exhaustive beauty advice to the letter, from cuticle care to painstaking treatment of teenage acne. 
Meanwhile, my morning routine was just insane. Every morning, I took on the weigh scale with the fury of a boxer facing her opponent. I stepped on the scale and braced myself for the punch. One, two, one. I stepped off in shock, unable to fathom that I'd gained weight on a slimming diet. I looked at my bloated brown figure in the mirror, my deceiving double. My instinct was to turn away, but I looked hard and long. I hadn't done that since I was 12, when the shock of pubic hair and the sudden bulge of breasts sent me into tailspin of suicidal grief. Two years on, and the grief was intensifying. In a daze, I stepped into the tub and ran hot water over my head and down my back, utterly disappointed with myself and my disobedient body. My breasts and belly extended into a grotesque shape. A handful of flesh on my belly had ballooned over my panty line, my thick upper thighs pressed tightly against one another, and my face was full and round, the hull of cheekbone lost under flab. No space, no bone, no self-control. I longed for the jutting pelvic bones and the glorious thigh gap for a sunken inward curving abdomen under a visible rib cage. Like the cover of Elle, whose light figure floated on a glossy page in her two-piece and carefree sheen. I stepped into my jeans and tucked them over my legs and thighs. I had gained a whole size. If, it wasn't for, if it, that wasn't punishment enough for my deplorable lack of self-discipline, I had to expose this body to the world and worse, to my grade nine classmates. It was gym day. By the curious and cruel hand of fate, I was surrounded in my small town Catholic school by beautiful tall girlisons, all fed on the same diet of pop culture. While they were faithful followers of fashion and celebrity trends, I was subject to the discount and hand-me-down ethos of my mother, a leftover of her early years as an immigrant. Mother was a faithful fan of the Mart, of Quebec, Bonnie Mart, Kmart, and her favorite, Miracle Mart. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, the cult of the Marts had resulted in a tacky wardrobe of styles and colors well suited for Halloween, not for high school. In my hideous gym shorts, I braced myself for the snide remark about my unshaven ape legs from the boys whose own fur would never meet the cruel sting of a razor or a humiliating remark. I had once heard that the hair of Punjabi girls was thicker, darker, and more tenacious than that of white girls, and that no amount of shaving, waxing, or grooming could conquer the mighty Punjabi follicle. <laughs> I don't know if this was true, but I figured that I was living proof. While Mina had inherited my mother's hairless gene, I had, just my luck, inherited the hairy gene of Auntie Gurinder Kaur from Patella, well known for her spectacular furry unibrow. <laughs> Today we're outside, said Mr. Reed, our phys, phys ed teacher, pointing his stubby finger toward the doors. We hauled ourselves off the benches and into the crisp, frigid air. The shock of cold pleased me. I was glad to be outdoors, where I was liberated from thinking, and my body was free to experience the mechanical grind of physical activity. I ran across the soggy field and icy grass, fueled with fat. My thighs thundered as each foot landed. As I orbited the track, I heard Mr. Reed barking. Ladies, move your fat butts, provoking the boys to push back any traces of femininity in themselves as if it were a disease, and impelling the girls to loathe their own natures. I ran fueled by those words and set in motion the fairy creature who followed the laws of a different nature when not ruled by sex or size, age, or time. Um,
I, I had another section in the book, but I think I'm, I'm over time. But we can go on with the rest of the authors. Uh, wait. Hi, Hi. Thank, this you, is a human thank you so much. <laughs> I just realized that you're kind of reading to, you know, a, a weird looking room and there's no one, no one interacting with you, so I'll just wave at you and thank you for reading from your, your debut novel. I'm really excited about it. Um, I think we will move on to the to the next authors if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Everyone. Welcome, Barzana. She'll be reading from her third novel, All Inclusive. So can I see if this is working? Can you hear at the back if I... Yeah? yeah? Okay, so that's, that's nice if I can be hands-free. Um, so I just want to thank the organizers and all the attendees here um, for having me. I feel very honored to be here. Um, I'm just going to read a section. Um, the, this novel goes back and forth between two characters, Aziz and Amira. And I'm just going to read um, two sections that are about Aziz. June 21st, 1985, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I've been watching her for a full 10 minutes. She sat at the table next to mine, reading a textbook entitled Understanding World Religions. It was the first day of summer and my second last in Canada. She absentmindedly played with her long auburn hair, her fingers moving like a magician's, conjuring it into a single braid. She didn't tie off the end, and her hair eventually resisted the arrangement and pulled itself free. I nibbled my honey cruller and waited for her to notice me. For another 10 minutes, I scripted my words. I was a chatty fellow back then, but it took immense bravery to speak to a woman I didn't know. I chided myself. What did it matter if I sounded like a fool? That looks like interesting reading. She glanced up and her cheeks blushed crimson. I loved when white girls did that. It just isn't the same with brown girls. Their pigment allows them to mute their embarrassment. The girl smiled and nodded and returned to her textbook, her lavender highlighter squeaking across the page. But I could tell she was no longer concentrating on the material. It's not bad, dry, but okay. Her tone was friendly. She looked at me with large, round eyes. What color were they? Hazel? Light brown? I sat up to stretch my five foot seven frame a little taller. I surmised we were about the same height. Have you reached the chapter on Islam yet? I'd be happy to explain anything you don't grasp. I'm Muslim, you know. Not exactly a worthy pickup line, but I was no Casanova. I'm reading it now, actually. She turned the book toward me, and indeed there was a photo of a gold dome mosque on the page. I'm not a very strict Muslim, but there are many things about Islam that I appreciate. I rambled on about it being a religion of peace and equality. I spoke with uncharacteristic enthusiasm. I hadn't prayed or fasted since I'd come to Canada just over five years earlier to begin my PhD. The photo of the mosque made me think I should visit the masjid when I went home. It would please my parents. I imagine all the world's religions share that. At their core, they're good. It's people who cause all the problems. The girl looked across at the empty parking lot then, and I wondered what had suddenly made her pensive. I took the, the opportunity to study her freckles. They dotted their way down her neck to her chest. She wore an orange blouse that cut low across her large breasts. She was pleasantly plump around her midsection. True. I took another bite of my donut, and its waxy coating flaked across my lap. I'm Nora. She reached out a hand, and her scent of sandalwood wafted over. Her palm was cool, her grip firm. How is that spelled? I can be idiotic when nervous. She spelled it slowly, N-O-R-A, and then asked me my name. Spell it, she joked. With false bravado, I grabbed a pen from her table and wrote A-Z-E-E-Z -E -E on a paper napkin. And I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. They continue talking. Eventually, I took a deep breath and asked if she had a boyfriend. And she blushed again 
and shook her head. I bought her a double-double, and I had another tea and cruller. When she invited me to her apartment to listen to her cassette tape collection, I gladly accepted. She fiddled with her boombox, popped in a Duran Duran cassette, and then flopped onto the bed. She beckoned me over from where I stood awkwardly by the door. I sat gingerly beside her and she took my hand. I wasn't surprised by the gesture. She'd slipped her arm through mine on the walk over. She leaned in close and I could tell she wanted me to kiss her. How unshrinking and unafraid Canadian girls were. I pushed my face into hers and didn't breathe for a long time. I wrapped her in my arms and she let me hold her tightly. We talked and kissed for hours. My fingers groped her soft waist, the downy peach fuzz on her arms. When I gazed into her eyes, I sensed a rare and special connection. And then suddenly, we were tearing away at our clothes. Her name is Rio and she dances on the sand. In my fantasies, it would have happened in cinematic slow motion. Unhurried, we'd have progressed to that point over several romantic dates. And when the disrobing finally happened, it would have been an alluring striptease. Perhaps in reality, things always move too quickly. And I'm going to skip ahead. I don't usually read this section. It's from the very last part of the book, because it's a bit of a spoiler. But um, I think maybe it fits uh, for this audience. So um, what happens, uh, as you can kind of guess from the date, um, is that Aziz is one of the people who died and on, on 182. And for 30 years, he remains in a liminal space as a ghost um, because he has to sort out some unfinished business. So we're now moving ahead 30 years, almost 30 years. June 13th, 2015. On June 13th, my girl waited in the British Airways queue. There were large groups of Indian families, some in Indian garb, most dressed semi-formally as though about to attend a fancy party. She wore jeans and a t-shirt and had packed a hoodie for the flight. Nora, her mother, stood with her, keeping her company in the lineup. Amira's breath was shallow, but I heard her expectation and nervousness for the journey ahead. She checked the time, calculating if she would be late despite getting to Pearson three hours early. She fiddled with her tickets and passport and felt for a folder of papers tucked into her purse, printouts of her hotel reservations and prepaid train tickets. She pressed the papers between her index finger and thumb, and their crispness slowed her heart rate. The folder also contained our address in Mumbai, Amira's destination, for three days hence. I'd wanted my family to squeeze into their car and greet her at the airport as a delegation. I'd hoped they'd have insisted she'd stay with them rather than book a hotel. Never mind, I knew it would only be a matter of time before their cautious hearts opened. Nora hugged Amira goodbye, and I inhaled maternal worry. Be safe. Come back to me. I boarded with Amira and took the vacant middle spot beside her window seat. For the first few hours of the flight, an ancient unease caused us both to fidget in our faux leather seats. I whispered peaceful thoughts while she dozed, and I knew I was really calming my own fear of flight, a phobia that would follow me for the next two lifetimes. As we neared Ireland, I drifted out over the Atlantic. I remembered rumpled wingtips, twisted scraps of fuselage, fragments of charred passenger seats, hundreds of falling bodies. I dove under the bitterly cold water and swam until I came to it, my body's final resting place. And I was not alone. While our physical remains were long gone, I sensed an undersea city of sorts, an impromptu gathering of Kanishka's souls. I knew I'd, been, I'd drawn them to me through sheer will, for I required one last look. 
Amongst the assembly was the attractive stewardess who'd served me my meals and the older lady who'd sat beside me on flight 182. There were too many of us to count, children and adults, those whose bodies had been recovered and those who were never found. We were together again, just for a few moments, a haunting reunion. And then, as though we never existed, we dispersed across the ocean. I drifted up, broke through the water surface, and continued to float higher. I caught up with my girl's airplane and watched it form a white trail across the sky. And then, without thinking about it, without consulting anything or anyone, I soared higher and higher, up and away from the earthly lives I'd been overseeing for nearly 30 years. I was unsure of my path, but certain that I needed to keep going. Thank you. Much thanks uh, to all the conference organizers. I'm deeply honored to read with these esteemed authors and before all of you. And a special uh, shout out to the family members who are here. I'm going to read um, uh, some poem fragments um, from Children of Air India, Unauthorized Exhibits and Interjections, and then some poem fragments from another long poem. They're both long poems, which is a genre I specialize in, um, from the um, to-be-released uh, book edited by Chandrima, Angela, and Amber, um, uh, The Art of Public Mourning. And, and uh, I'll say a bit more about that after in the discussion. Can everyone hear me at the back? Can you hear me okay? Good. The kick of my leg, the kick of my leg, the edge of my blade, the edge of my blade, soccer and hockey, I was that kind of Canadian boy. Ask father about practice. Drive with him to the arena, sit with him inside. Air cold enough to lock down memory, movement is hinge. Ask father, to walk with you to the edge, park where I played, in movement release, in movement release. Father will tell you how smart I am math, sciences, French, English, language scrapes against my edge. Indian, Canadian, English, French, melt, icicle, dialects, these fragments, but skull to grass, follow father home. Is my room still as it was? The year of my death, the year of my death. Kick down the doors and scrape. Edge of a basement floor. List every item in my bedroom. Look for hockey posters. Bodies gyrate, rock stars jump, knees bend, laminated cardboard. Insert names here, they are redacted. Ask father to play Sony for you. It's 1985 and there is my Walkman, my electronic inventions. Ask father to stop roaming the rooms of our home. If you cannot find him, he will have joined me. Ask us about joining. Mother and daughter. I've never read this poem out loud, so it's for all of you. Your body always under mother's eye, traveling companion she sees. Your breasts rise, fall tight, shirt pulsating, 16, impenetrable under mother's eye. Your smooth black hair flowing, S-shaped, crown oiled, night in the bathroom upstairs. Your kingdom, North American suburban home, always there is the mother natter. Your grades, your clothes, you're not wearing that on the plane. Cover yourself. Your big flight, dress up, it is an event your tightest jeans, your mother's scolds, your obedience wearing chiffon and its dressy folds. Remember to iron your slip, your two-inch strappy sandals in the airport, mother's eye up, down, your washroom stall maneuver, nylons peel off hand to feet. This is flesh, its release. Your eyes never to be mother, never to suckle a child. Also there is aunt, also there is grandmother. These links generations waiting to board on the plane, it is ours and you talk grades, talk school, talk story within story, your aunt, mother, grandmother, your family. Tale of tales within language, fable, gossip, secret, scandals, anecdotal, listening, not listening, your mother's words 
dense, sticky, gummy, your gloss-coated lips trailing conversation, your mother's love, smothering love, envy love, watching love, jealousy love, eyeing up and down, love inter interrogation, interrogation, love assessment, love getting love, amassing love, grimy, your love lies gritty on your tongue, the conversation of four women. You will talk, you will sigh, you will go to the toilet twice, three times, cramped, the light in, inside the stall, green tinged, acrid whiff of smoke, the hours, them, you, on Air India, flight 182, you are 16, soon to be released, scattered, soon you are with your women, mouth, teeth, tongue, lips, curl, lift, open, sound, speak Punjabi. There is the sometimes in English all women story talk. It is all weaving family fabric, not unlike the chiffon of your dress, light but it sticks. Your full breasts, your ears hearing, not hearing the words, your own words said to yourself. They will never get to hear about the boy in Chem 11, about his fair hair, his arms, holding his watching you his mouth moving you your thighs in the airplane seat you clench release buttocks legs feet hands fingers knuckles not swollen not bruised young and clench release this summer trip your body your family multiple of four it is the mother line stretching soon it will be broken Elegy for Courtroom 20, Vancouver Law Courts. Search gate outside the courtroom. Citizens security screened. Lexan glass to separate the body of the court. Public gallery. 149 seats and video monitors. Three locations allowing for unobstructed views. Everyone watches the proceedings. Exhibit. June 23rd, 1985, detonation. In the airplane, a hole blows open. Left, aft, fuselage, the drop 31,000 feet into the Atlantic. From the archive, the wait. Everything was normal. Ocean and recovery, intense speculation, partial inflation, 39.8%. Emotional effects, extent and severity, plastic sheeting, a chain of command, an orderly fashion, 132, everything was normal. Passengers and airlines, lines and comparison, volumes and discovery, cascading failure, attached to a limb, unidentified noise, numerous agencies, corrections, pending and requests. Identified changes in lieu of documents, resource insufficiency, protracted and complex, necessary discussions, inadequate security, 82 children under the age of 13. She was asleep with a slight dent on her nose. She was asleep with a slight dent. She was asleep. She was asleep. She was asleep with a slight dent on her nose. She was asleep with a slight dent on her nose. She was asleep with a slight dent on her nose. And her redactions. Where were you born? Colloquial. Where are you from? Pune, India. Pune, India. Your name? Your father? Name redacted. India. Your mother? Name redacted. India. But you all Canadian. Yes, no, yes, yes. Your aunt and uncle, your cousin. India. Growing up, did you see yourself as part of a community? Newfoundland, northern Quebec, Montreal. And then? Small town Saskatchewan, New Westminster, British. What's that? British. What is your purpose in telling this story? Mother, name redacted, she lost her youngest sister. Rogue fragments. What betrayals occur with each telling? Where is her story? Mother, who is daughter. She and her sorry, who held you in her arms. She and her sorry, big city girl didn't even know how to boil an egg. Mumbai to St. John's, she and her sari who married. What happened? Informant. You will need to take out your own story. C-A-N-A-D-A. -A -A. 
In the aftertime, always there is also the before. June 23rd, 1985, threads, filaments, water, air, spirits, list every nation, immigrant, imminent, arrival, dispossession, carryover, a chain of tales, Air India, disruption, the way of things. What is not mentioned? Before is a place. History as surveillance comes a morning and a plane, and sweep, bally green, bally green. Unauthorized interjection. Not him, he shouldn't be here, he is here. Those on the cusp become center, a gyre clamors its way. Air India always happening, imagine this bomb builder boy. See him running, happy and free. Ludhiana, Chandigarh. Oh, village of Paldi. Oh, town of Duncan. All my country people, come, stranger, point to this boy. Holding his mother's hands on the streets of London. Stranger, make your pronouncement. Boy, you will be the one. Intruder, if there is childhood, I am on a farm milking cows, hands on an udder. And then, and then, and then, and then in our kitchen, mother makes roti. It is not June. It is not 1985. No sulfur, no potassium, no cadmium. Ma, ma, grum, gram, areba. Time splits. I'm a young man on Vancouver Island, upriver by the potholes. Back roads, dust on my face. Rusted flatbed rattling over riprap. It is only a small fire I make to cook trout. Exhibit number one. She boards the plane, Indo-Canadian, this hybrid condition grown into her bones, situation, first solo journey. Baggage left behind, sister, age 11. She is your queen, shimmering 15-year-old, you love, hate, love, the night before, Air India, Flight 182, bad dreams propel. There you are, together in the bedroom and sweat on your foreheads. Coroner's report, black hair matted and wound around a 23 centimeter metal bar toward the back of the skull. Exhibit number two. He runs down a hallway in an airport Mouth open at the side of one lip, a curdle of spit. Brown owl eyes widen his face, chubby child, at the juncture of wrist, ankle, plump, smooth skin. Chattering and loud, he kicks and kicks where vinyl seat coverings join tubular metal, row on row, fists open, release. Find his mother's hair and he pulls. Pull on time now, child. Three years old, status unknown. And I'm just going to read five short fragments from the new work that's coming out with thanks to the authors who are all here and we'll hear more hopefully about this amazing book from the Art of Public Mourning. I was commissioned to write a, another long poem. So these have never been read before. So thank you for the opportunity. And I think I'd ask you to think of these little fragments as a kind of postscript to the, to the sequence I shared with you. Message from the archive, procedures for unaccompanied sorrow. Mourners must present an object valid enough for experience. June 23rd, 1985, morning over the Atlantic. Dear cousin, these moments of inscription, stranded, all around us digital, age of staccato. Everyone addresses someone and these letters remain unsent. Testimony, that space between tear and terror. Dear cousin, I lose count of the years. 
each letter about to be sent. Your loss, everything, and I, mother of no one, have made other children my own. Is it monstrous to conjure ghosts when they, free to float elsewhere, must travel long distances? Dear cousin, into this space seen by no one, except that most intimate stranger, the audience, the reader. Add your longings, add your dreams to banish he who intrudes June 23rd, 1985. In the morning, in the garden, up at the home house, in the town of towns, cigar smoke rises. There is your father in the far corner, past the roses, down by the peonies, lush magenta. I cannot name for you the fragrance. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Those are some hard acts to follow. Um, it's a huge privilege to be here, part of this conversation that's bringing together community perspectives with scholarship and artists. It really does feel like a very unusual occasion. And, uh, you know, as I said, a huge privilege to, to be here for, you know, for some of these challenging conversations. Um, as Melissa said, my novel, The Ever After of Ashwin Drav, is told by a psychotherapist, Ashwin Drav, who periodically disappears from the narrative, as in the little piece that I'll be reading to you. The book was also um, inspired in many ways by poetry and a number of specific poems, many of which are well known, and I've started to find myself wanting to, opening, to, to open readings uh, with those poems. And so I'd like first to read you one of those poems, and then I'll go on to do a section from the novel. So this poem is One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. Excuse me, I'm a little hoarse. <coughs> the art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, that my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them but it wasn't a disaster, even losing you. The joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied, it's evident. The art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Elizabeth Bishop. And so the piece of my own book that I would like to read to you takes place in Ireland. Um, sort of a follow-on to Farzana's piece in a way. Um, you'll see this from the perspective of Seth, who is a man whose story Ashwin is attempting to tell. Seth lives in a fictional town in Western Canada, Lohikarma. Venkat is his friend. And Venkat's wife, Sita, and son, Sundar, only son, Sundar, were aboard the plane, and this is June 27, 1985, when Seth has gone with Venkat, accompanied him to Ireland. We heard earlier very touchingly from Dr. Gupta about the sorts of ways that families came together around the time, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, and Seth is a very close companion to Venkat through, um, through this time when they're going there in hopes of identifying or perhaps finding alive that hope was still there for some time his wife and son. From Vancouver, Seth and Venkat flew the same route the dead had flown, bouncing from Toronto to Montreal and out over the Atlantic. <coughs> <coughs> 
The jet was nearly empty, holidays canceled, relatives in India saying, it's not worth it, stay back. Seth looked around the cabin, repopulating it with the passengers of the lost plane, eating breakfast, watching TV. How long till the vanished became invisible? A little under an hour from Heathrow, he tried to look down through the clouds, but his forehead wrapped the invisible inner layer of the acrylic window. Beside him, Venkat sat straight, staring, unresponsive, only his knuckles white on the armrests, suggesting tension rather than catatonia. But as they passed through the airplane-shaped void where Air India 182 had exploded, nothing happened. In London, beautifully groomed Air India employees came forward to escort them to their connection gate, trailed by a white Canadian in a suit with a maple leaf pin on his lapel. He seemed relieved to have delivered them. In Cork, each family was met by its own cop, sent by the Irish Gardai, and its own grief counselor, usually a nun. Venkat's was Sister Bernadette. She introduced herself first to Seth, who explained his own role as she continued to hold the hand she had shaken. Then she took Venkat's unresisting arm, murmuring some words Seth couldn't hear in a brogue he barely understood, not that it mattered. She was a guiding spirit in a cloud-gray cardigan, and Seth, as he followed her, felt something inside him, twisted tight all week, release a little. Sister Bernadette sat them down. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the coroner is still working with the bodies. As soon as they are finished, then families can start identifying their loved ones, she said. There was in her voice a greater comprehension of disaster than Saith himself felt. In the days following, it seemed all of County Cork was working to provide some comfort to the families and see the bodies recovered and returned. They are only piece of luck, the families would say later. In a bigger place, it wouldn't have been like that. In London, they would have been ignored. In a more insular place, no one would have known what to do with them. But in a place where everyone had tragedy mapped on the palms of their hands, where every family tree was torn by civil war or immigration, famine or sudden squalls at sea, here they knew how to address themselves to death. Sister Bernadette asked Venkat if he had brought pictures of his family. He had tucked two small albums in his shoulder bag and took them out now to show her. I have dry clothes for them in my suitcase. A nearby hotel had been found for them, and a coach trip had been arranged for the next morning to Bantry Bay, the closest point on land to where the plane had last signaled its existence, to the point in the water where two days ago... <coughs> two sharks were added to the body count. After a quick assembly at the hospital, Seth found his limbs were waterlogged with a drastic, irresistible fatigue and asked whether they could be taken to their hotel. At a small family-run place, about 10 miles from the hospital, they were shown to their room. Thank you. Two double beds on a carpet, the same rose tint of Venkat's at home in Lohikarma. Sister Bernadette said she would be back for them in the morning. The digital clock at his bedside glowed 3 a.m. when Seth woke. He didn't see Venkat at first and sat up, afraid he might have gone out, his eyes adjusting, lit on an empty, chintz-covered armchair in a corner. Venkat was seated on the floor in front of it. Seth stood and breathed the air of the room, which could have been that of any hotel room, anywhere, vacuum cleaner, tinted with the faintly chemical scent of roses. Their expedition, the reason for it, the seawater slicked bodies, the shards of aircraft corkscrewed to the white breast of the dim sea, all felt less and less real, farther away, not closer. It will mean so much to Sita that you have come, Venkat spoke, their eyes in the dark unmeeting. She's not the type to chatter, you know, it's hard on her. She can feel very alone at gatherings, everyone else making small talk, but with you and Lakshmi, she relaxes. Seth saw in Venkat's hands a mala of Rudraksha beads. Rudraksha, eye of Shiva. The story, in Seth's vague recollection, was that the Rudraksha tree sprang from the earth wherever Shiva's tears watered it. What was he crying about? Seth had forgotten, if ever he knew. Wanne, wanne, kanne, kanne. The Tamil proverb popped into Seth's head now. When had he last heard it spoken? Possibly his mother's sister. She had a proverb for everything, though this one was common. An only son is as precious as an eye. 
He and Venkat meditated on the, name of the, on the name of the god who rules the realms of destruction until it was time to prepare, for the way, prepare the way for the light of day when they started praying to the sun. When the alarm rang at 6.30, they had been chanting the Gayatri Mantra for over an hour. Seth showered first, then Venkat. Dressed, they went down to the breakfast room where they had beans on toast, oatmeal, and strong, scalding tea. At 7.30, when, when they were waiting outside for the coach, a young woman with short brown hair exited the garden of the house beside them, pushing a pram and holding the hand of a small boy. As she turned toward Seth and Venkat, her pretty mouth froze, and she yanked her son back. Seth, without turning, saw this from the corner of his eye. He felt the familiar pinch of shame and rage that the few instances of overt racism he had faced in Canada had brought on. His children had had it worse. For several months, there was a little gang of older kids who harassed Brinda and Renjani as they walked to school. Once, the kids threw eggs. Packies, go home, they would shout. The woman reversed back through her gate, and Seth wondered... <clears throat> what she found threatening about two middle-aged men in neatly pressed trousers, accompanied by a nun, no less. <clears throat> he had heard about the UK, riots in London, a racism entrenched, practically institutionalized by a hundred years of colonial migration, in, colonial migration. In Canada, it was rare and random, as though they hadn't yet figured out how to do it properly. Seth had found some older children to walk to school with his own, identified the culprits, met with appalled parents who assured him that they would discipline their children. The bullying stopped after that. Clearly, even Canadian parents had some control over their kids if they chose to exercise it. Then the Irish mother emerged again from her front door, biting the insides of her pink cheeks. Her son gripped a plastic bag, encasing a wad of wet newspaper wrapped around half a dozen bent and thorny stems of fat pink roses. They came up to Seth and Venkat, and the woman said, we are all so very sorry for your loss. Please, can we give you these? The little boy held the bouquet out to them with stiff arms. Venkat took the roses and wrapped the boy in a hug, which he accepted for a moment before wiggling free. A little sister with her mother's eyes watched, unsmiling from the pram. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>